Hola, pod peeps across the digital domain. It's the Deacon's Pod, where spirituality and justice meet real American life in the 21st century. I'm Deacon Dennis. Say hello to my co-conspirators, Paulist affiliate deacons, Deacon Tom and Deacon Drew. Hi, it's Deacon Drew. Like my friends, I am a Paulist deacon affiliate. What that means is originally all three of us were Catholic deacons in the church who became Paulist deacon affiliates. It's a relatively new program in Paulus, for the Paulist fathers. And I live in New Jersey. I serve in a parish like all deacons or like most deacons. And I am so happy to be here sharing the charisms and the missions of the Paulist Fathers in a way that's embracing to everyone, welcoming to everyone, and hopefully will show the joy that we three of us have, as well as all those in the church who are ministering to the people who love Christ. Hey, thank you, Deacon Dennis and Deacon Drew. This is Deacon Tom. I am down here in sunny Florida, having moved here from New England. I too am a Paulist Deacon affiliate, and I am looking forward to our working together to help share the joy and trials and tribulations of our faith, to have a good time doing this, to be able to reach out to people who might be like many of us, searching our souls and hearts to find meaning and uh, goodness in the life around us. So with my compadres here, we are looking forward to sharing uh, our journey and to welcome others looking to do the same. And I'm Deacon Dennis, also in sunny Florida on the Gulf Coast. Thank you very much. Formerly from New England as well as Tom. Spent many years in uh, prison ministry, actually. Also did some writing, some teaching, and had a, had a lot of fun doing that. And now we're down here. I'm also a Paulist affiliate deacon. I'm glad to be. I've long admired the uh, Paulist Fathers and their ability to innovate and to uh, reach people and to try to deal with the world that we live in now. It seems to me that a lot of times we're dealing with a world that no longer exists, which I, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but the Paulists seem to have a real gift for, for moving ahead with new approaches and new ideas, and I wanted to be a part of that. So guys, let me ask you a question. Why this podcast? What are we doing here? Well, I think it's a way for us to welcome people who are standing in the door or who may be standing in the door to either leave the church or to enter the church, and they're just not sure which way they want to go. I think that's consistent with the mission of the Paulist Fathers in terms of reaching out to the people on the margins. And when we look around, I think we notice that there are not a lot of places that just talk about the joy and the faith that the people have in Christ without imposing a lot of restrictions. And of course, we've talked about this, Dennis and Tom, and I think we're all on the same page with this, but I will tell you that I'm looking forward to getting together on a regular basis with the two of you and talking about our faith and talking about ways that we find joy in our faith and ways that we want to reach out to let others come into our house and find that same joy with us. That's why I think we're doing this. Tom? Yes, I just look back at history. We've got a, a tradition, thousands of years old, built on a tradition, thousands of years old. So look back to the 1500s in Gutenberg and the Bible and how that transformed the world, right? So here we are uh, in the uh, third millennium and we could sit down in our homes and we could tell the story of our faith journey, our experiences. And as deacons, we all get a ton of complaints. We hear from the people inside church, one group, but we go about life and we hear from people who are on the fringes, who have left the church and they're complaining and they're angry. And it seems to me, in my experience, no one is addressing them. No one is listening. Now we got the synod coming up. A uh, synod, is, we're supposed to be listening to people and finding out the complaints. Well, our church is not the fastest to respond to those complaints, but we can be the ears that hear what people are saying about our church, and we could be the ones to give an unofficial response. Well, actually an official response to what's going on. Look at the challenges we face. They're numerous, and this is our first lesson, so we don't wanna pollute the water right off the get-go. But we have fun 
in the midst of all the challenges we face. So that's why I'm here to be able to share my experiences. I come from a background of finance. I was in the best, the biggest uh, banks in New England as a treasury department official. At the same time, I felt like massive being called away from the table and to see that there's more to life than this world of commerce around. So we get in the nitty gritty of that and the good Lord moved me from the, the county table to the prisons. So like Deacon Dennis, I was a prison chaplain for a while. It's all been good. Life's journey has been good. And my faith has been good to me, helping me understand the world, helping me understand myself, helping me grow in faith to see there's more to life than this um, glitter around us. So that's why I'm here. Yeah, you know, we're glad Tom's here. Glad you're here too, Drew. I'm here because basically this is the same thing, just echoing what you both said, that there's gold in them, our hills. And I think that gets lost in the sauce. People get so, you know, the news, it, it's just negative and, and it's about the institution and it just the baby goes out with the bathwater. It's, I'm not here for the institution. And the institutions are, are, are necessary evil. They, they, we all got them. I mean, Tom was in finance, Drew was in law. There's all things we could sit and talk about what's wrong with those institutions just as much and following guidelines. And when you have a big organization, obviously you have to have it. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I get the word of God and the bread of life. I'm here because I am a much better human than I would have been if I wasn't here. Much better. And if you don't believe me, my wife's in the other room. I can call her in and she'll tell you. So we're here. I'm here to especially to reach out to the people that are on the threshold, don't know whether they're going to come in, go out, people on the margins. I'm here because I want to share with them our own strength, hope, and faith, what we found the pearl of great price look what we found it's as simple as that that the great ancient catholic spiritual wisdom tradition it's like a big buffet table and the great thing about a buffet is you don't have to eat what i eat you got your choice i mean everybody's got to eat but you get a choice and so everybody's happy and there are so many things so many approaches and most people most catholics do not know what is available to them in their church for their own happiness, growth, comfort, challenge, all these things are sitting right there. Most Catholics, I think, are like people starving at a banquet. It's really unfortunate. And when I would take classes, it would always struck me, just to make this point, it's we, like our faith is like a supermarket as opposed to the corner store. You know, you go to the corner store, they might have one of this, one of that. And we go in here to Super Walmart or whatever it is, and it's, look at all these choices we have. You, you're talking about in terms of spirituality choices, correct? In other words, all how to pray or how to worship. Spirituality, service, lifestyles. We have hermits. You want to be a hermit? Come over here. We got people to show you how to do that. <laughs> I only raise that, Dennis, because being three loyal permanent deacons in the Catholic Church, let's make sure we nip something in the bud right away. You're not talking about being a cafeteria Catholic. You're talking about all the food that's placed on the table by our church. Yeah, right? it's all legitimate stuff. It's your choice. There's a lot, and right. this is another thing people don't understand. You have a lot of free choice. There's very little that we would call dogma that, okay, you have to subscribe to this to be a member. And that's not mostly what people are upset about is the resurrection, for example, being one of those dogmas. You have to believe to be in the club, Jesus rose from the dead. I don't hear people really upset about that or that's a problem or whatever, but we have a lot of legitimate choices that you don't have to pray the way I pray, live my lifestyle. There's just a, an awful lot there. And it's amazing because one experience I had in, in school was I took a couple of classes in world religion and we do Buddhism and Hinduism and this and that and look at all the Islam, whatever, and look at it. And I, how often I would be sitting there going, oh, we got that. Well, we pray with beads. We got that. What's it? Meditate? Yeah, we have meditation. We get, it was like, this is where I really realized what a supermarket was available to us. So I'm hoping to share some of that with people to lift them up and to show them the buffet, as uh, Drew said, that is perfectly legitimate, is laid out by the church for you to choose from. This is not some, something we're pulling on somebody or uh, shaving the, the, the circle or whatever. That, that's why I'm here, because there's so much. There is so much that's right. There's so much that is good. And 
we shouldn't miss out on that because we, of headlines or something. we just want to share it we just yeah. want to share it Today we're going to be talking to Kaya Oaks, who is a writer living in the San Francisco Bay Area. She teaches at the University of California, Berkeley, has been teaching there since 1999. She teaches writing. She's a contributing writer for America Magazine, Slate, The New Republic, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, Sojourners, Commonweal, NCR, Washington Post, and numerous other publications. She has published five books, including the one we're going to talk about today, The Defiant Middle, How Women Claim Life's In-Betweens to Remake the World, as well as Radical Reinvention, An Unlikely Return to the Catholic Church, The Nuns Are All Right, that's N-O-N-E-S, the N-U-N-S are all right too, but her book is The Nuns Are All Right, A New Generation of Seekers, Believers, and Those In-Between, Radical Reinvention, an unlikely return to the Catholic Church, and Slanted and Enchanted, the Evolution of Indie Culture. She's the perfect guest for this podcast, and in, by the way, she's our very first guest, because this podcast is rooted in the mission and the charisms of the Paulist Fathers, reaching out to those on the margins, caught in the middle, seeking God in a turbulent world and a turbulent church which is really what her book, The Defiant Middle, is all about. So with that, let's get started. Welcome, Kaya Oaks. It's really quite a pleasure and and, an exciting thing for us, Deacons Pod, the three deacons that are here with you, to have you as actually our first guest. And as I think through it, you're really the perfect first guest because when you look at what you've written in the past, about reinventing yourself and coming back to the church and, and your book about the nuns and now the defiant middle and all the articles that I've read by you, you just fall right into that wheelhouse that we have as uh, Paulist deacons or Paulist deacon affiliates. We're not technically Paulist deacons that fits the char- charisms and the mission of the Paulist fathers. And so welcome. And we're really pleased that you're here with us today. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. I'm very familiar with the Paulists. I grew up in a Paulist parish here in Berkeley, California, or I live in Oakland, but grew up going to Newman Hall, Holy Spirit, and still go there sometimes today. So we're here to talk about, among other things, your book, The Defiant Middle, How Women Claim Life's In-Betweens to Remake the World. And I'll just start by saying it's just such an exciting book because one thing is I can't categorize it. I can't say what it actually, what it's about. And I'll tell you why I say that. I mean, it's about women. It's about women and religion. It's about what I'll say is post-feminism, but you can correct me if that term is, is somehow incorrect. And it's about the way the world works in connection with women and men, because it's really about men too, because of these expectations that you talk about. It makes a compelling argument if I can preach to you about your own book, that women find themselves in any number of places, sometimes simultaneously, in which expectations are imposed on them by the church, by patriarchy, by the culture, by history, and limits you, limits the women. You specifically discuss that you're confronted with an attitude that they are, and these are the chapters, really, I'm I'm running through, so if any reader hasn't picked up your book yet, too young or too old, or too crazy, or too barren, or too butch, femme, other, or too angry, or too alone. And it's very clear that sometimes almost all of these categories can apply to any woman at any time. You connect a lot of this dysfunction to the church and mention, when I shouldn't say the church, but the history of the church, and maybe the church too, and mention the way that we think and talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Joan of Arc, Julian of Norwich, and others has really colored the way that we view other women and the way they should be behaving. When I say we, I guess the world, and I just want to point out one thing. In my profession, which is the law, and supposedly secular, I have seen women criticized to their faces and behind their backs 
as being either too dressed up or not dressed up enough or acting too much like a man or acting too much like a woman. Uh, these are not criticisms that I have in over 40 years of practice ever seen leveled at a man. So my question is this, is it that the patriarchy and the church over the course of the last 2000 years has influenced the secular? Or is it just a man thing? Uh, I'm going to go with both and <laughs> my favorite answer to all questions. There's a cause and effect relationship throughout history between institutional religion and how our ideas of gender have evolved. So where we are today, looking backwards, we can definitely say that in its history, the Catholic Church as an institution has not always treated women very well. And that has then not just the Catholic Church. So if we're talking about the United States of America, there's other threads like Calvinism and Puritanism that come in. I don't have to go through all of that, but I love history. So one of the things that history teaches us is that these ideas from religion that are often like quoting the Bible out of context and things like that end up having an impact in secular culture. And I'm glad that today, and in fact, have been talking with my students about this over the past few weeks, men are learning that a lot of these problems are related to the way they're raised. So men being brought up not to express emotions or not to communicate their feelings, and then the feelings get bottled up and become problematic. And so I think that happens in the church because of clericalism and this idea that priests are different and special and that they're flawless and they're not, they're just human beings. And so I think it's important for men to realize that the way they were raised is part of the problem. So I guess a long-winded answer to your question. It's not one thing or another, it's a web of issues, but one of them is the way that men are taught to be and what, how we understand masculinity is just as problematic as how we understand women. In your prelude in the book, you say, in some ways we are in the same boat, you're referring to men and women, but women are doing most of the rowing while men are steering the ship. The one thing I really want to mention, I meant to mention it in the beginning, is I just love the way you write. I mean, there's so many turns of phrase in here. There's one where you talk about Mary Magdalene. She's the first person Jesus appears to. And she goes to tell the other apostles, the other disciples, and they don't believe her. And they tell her that obviously she's wrong. And as Oakes writes, uh, apparently the first example of mansplaining in the history of the church. Which, and it's funny, I mean, I have preached on that on a few occasions and to the point where my wife has said, maybe you should calm down about that before they all walk out the door. Anyway, let me ask you this. I am a boomer. I am definitely a boomer and I grew up in the South and I was taught a way to look at and think about women and to consider who women are in a way that I no longer do try to think about that way. I've tried to unlearn all the things that I was raised with. So when my son was born, my wife and I tried to teach him a different way to be with women and about women, to be more open and not to, and to express his emotions from time to time. My question, I guess, is this, do you see a difference in the different generations? Do, have you perceived a difference in the different generations as to their views about women and how they would fit into the problems that occur that you talk about in this book. To a certain extent, it's getting better. I work with, I don't know what we're calling them, Gen Z or Zoomers. I, they're 18 to 20 and my students are aware of these issues. So even if they are, let's take, for example, a male athlete. So like athletic culture, as we know, is overwhelmingly masculine. When you talk about team sports, there's a kind of masculinity in team, male team sports, a competitive masculinity. But even they, even the most kind of macho athlete who takes a class that I teach, who I talk to, 
is aware of these issues and knows not to catcall women on the street or talk about women's bodies in the middle of class or something like that. So that objectification has changed. Communication is still a struggle, though. I do think that it's hard. I'm a Gen Xer, and so I am trying to unlearn some of the things I learned about being a woman, like not speaking up, not saying what I want. And my father was of, he was older than a boomer. He's passed away. But if he were alive, he'd be 80. So I guess he's somewhere at the end of one generation, the beginning of another. Anyway, but he was in that generation where men really ruled the house and women were were beneath uh, a man. So I've had to unlearn in my own marriage and in my relationships with men that kind of submissive positioning that traditional ideas lead to. But I think it is getting better. I'm so... It, I admire young adults so much. They're so expressive and so thoughtful and so concerned about the environment and the, and, and racial issues and gender, and they really want to make a better world for the future. And so I think I'm very hopeful that they will take the reins on these issues and help improve things. Okay. Every chapter of this book really uh, gave me pause, gave me a lot to think about. I had to stop just read one chapter at a time, really. I couldn't just go through the book. But perhaps the chapter, Too Crazy, <laughs> disturbed me the most. When I say disturbed, I mean made me think, made me wonder where I've been in some of these issues. And then again, from my legal background, I was really taken with that on page um, 63, the things that women could not do legally in 1971. We've come a long way since then. But you make the point, I think, and I don't disagree with you, that we haven't come far enough. We haven't come all the way. How dangerous is it today for women to continue to advocate for equality? It depends on where you are. My life in Berkeley is very different than that of a person in India or the Sudan or the Middle East. And I try to remember that, that we live in a global world and that women have different struggles. And again, this is where living in a, in a part of the country that has a lot of international population is really helpful in seeing how other women live their lives and, and what they encounter. So let's talk about how that manifests in the Catholic Church for a minute. So it's hard to talk about things like women's ordination, is off the table as a conversation in many parts of the church, right? That's one example. Why is that? Because the Vatican has spoken. And so the conversation kind of ends there. Of course, people talk about it outside of the institute. So maybe if there's a women's group at your parish, you'll talk about women's ordination. And women will be very open within that group about things like having a vocation or wanting to be deacons. Here I am on the deacons podcast. And there's been some moves toward ordaining women as deacons, but the conversation is largely closed at the moment, from what I understand. And so when you talk about the danger of advocating for equality, it's very hard to find places to write about these things. Publications that are controlled by the church, like America Magazine, love it. I write for them. I've written for them for 10 years. They can't run articles that question certain things about the church because they're, the Jesuit order is always under a microscope, so they have to be careful about that. So then you have to go to NCR, National Catholic Reporter, which is the progressive Catholic magazine, but not everybody reads that. And so there's a lot of siloing and of audiences, and you know that as Paulus, that people will seek out a Paulus parish because of the reputation of the Paulus or the Jesuits or the Franciscans or something like that, rather than go to the diocesan church because of this perception that's going to be really conservative and I'm not going to like the preaching or something like that. And so when you talk about the danger, I think outspokenness is very dangerous for women in the church. And when I say that, I think of someone like Elizabeth Johnson, 
who's a theologian who te taught at Fordham and wrote many landmark books of theology that many priests have read, but was censured by the Vatican not that long ago. And Janine Gramick, who is a sister who runs a group called New Ways Ministry for LGBTQ Catholics, she's had a lot of struggles in her life. So as an outspoken woman in the church, she's had problems in the past. So I think that siloing uh, leads to some parts of the church being more dangerous than others. And and I wanted to mention that because I admire the Paulus and I, I really like all the deacons and, the, and deacon associates that I've met over the course of my life, but I've never had the opportunity to do some of the things that you all do. And that's only because of my gender. And I don't resent it. I'm not angry about it. I went through the anger years ago and I worked on it in therapy for a long time. And now what I do instead is I see my role as a writer to lift these issues up and advocate for other people in the church who feel that they don't get to do what they'd like to do in the church. So, it, 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 You've really hit the nail on the head here. It is difficult to talk about depending on where you're sitting or whether your, your microphone is turned on. Because even for deacons, there uh, are deacons who I think would advocate for the ordination of women, especially as deacons, and maybe especially as priests. But we, those of us who may advocate for that still have to be careful where we talk about it. I mean, we cannot, we have to be careful from the AMBO and we have to be careful on our podcast. <laughs> so. So we're making it clear right now that we're not advocating for the ordination <laughs> of women. We're just saying that there are people who would like to advocate for that. And it's hard for them to find a place to do that. Right. So there's your disclaimer. And I think when they do find that place, they're advocating to the people who agree with them. They don't really have a chance to advocate to the people who disagree. Exactly. So. And that's why there's never any progress on the issue. So this committee that's apparently in the Vatican talking about women deacons is in a bubble of only talking to theologians, talking to each other and looking at history. And that bubble rarely gets burst enough for us to hear what's going on. One of the um, issues that we deacons talk about when I say we deacons, I mean the ones that are on this podcast. Tom Casey and Dennis Dolan with me are, why should we even stay in the church when there are issues that need to be dealt with? And I'm not, it doesn't have to be necessarily about the ordination of women. I mean, the abuse scandal drove a lot of people away, yet we stay and we stay in here. And maybe this delves a little bit into your earlier book. What is a good reason to stay in the church from your perspective? When people ask me that question, I always think of Hopkins. Um, the great Jesuit poet and the line from his poem, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And I think that Catholicism, and I've talked about for years with um, other Catholics and uh, why do we stay in the church? Well, the sacramental imagination is really important to me and the idea of creation being charged with, and creation as an act of God. I see there's evidence for that, for all the problems with the church, the, the people within it are really aware of that. And that is something that transcends politics and gender and race. You can go to a church in here in the Bay area. If I go to the black Catholic church down the street, or I go to the Dominican priory and it's up the street. Um, and it's it, it, in two entirely different parishes, the message the central message of the mass is always the same. And I find that very consoling. And I also think that, and, and this is something my friend, Michael Lachlan mentioned last night, we were doing an event together in, our, in San Francisco and he's an out gay Catholic journalist. And, and someone asked him the same question. And he said, you have to be ready to, when you decide to be in the church, in spite of the problems that it has and some of the problems in its history, you make a commitment and you make a commitment to try to be there for the long haul. And I think that's really important. It's like a relationship. You don't get, you get married once, but every day you have to decide whether to stay married or not. <laughs> some people get married once, sorry. <laughs> 
No, I, I like that. I like the, the, the looking at it like that. We've talked about it too. I mean, Tom and Dennis, feel free to chip in here, but my view is that it, it's sac you said sacramental and, and that's primarily why I'm here. I converted from, I was a Protestant. And when I started going to mass with the woman who would become my wife and somebody told me that host is actually Jesus, I was blown away. And that's what got, and that's what drew me in. So we've got all these issues. Your book really, it's just, and I can't believe, I, I hope it just comes out the right way. I can't believe how short the book is because there is so much information in here. I mean, it's just good information, beautifully written, very powerful. It's less than 200 pages, 200 pages long. So anybody who's listening to this, go out and buy the book. Now, solutions to these issues. You do in the the book on a note of hope. You want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, it seems to me that it comes from community. That's Dorothy Day at the end of The Long Loneliness. She says, we've all felt the long loneliness and found that the solution is love and that love comes with community. I think all of us are ultimately seeking to be in community with one another across gender and politics and understanding and everything else. That's really, I think I wanted to end the book the way that I do and no spoilers involved in saying the book ends by talking to men and women both. And the reason I did that is because I want men to be part of this conversation. If men are not part of the conversation about women, then we're never going to get anywhere. And I think that's where listening, I need to listen to men and men need to listen to us. And that's where community begins is in listening, empathetic listening, trying to put ourselves in the other person's position and to listen to their pain and their joys. And yeah, so that's my task as a writer is to take things in and then repeat them in some form. That's, I think, a challenge for all of us. I was uh, the beneficiary of the, the lottery that uh, got your book, Radical Reinvention, which uh, to me was a beautiful story, it, especially the, the focal point on uh, that journeying back in and how people came into your life, how you responded to them and how you really had to do what scripture calls us to do is stretch. Even though you're professionally trained in many ways, the church gig was, was pretty rugged. I, I sympathized with you on that eight day silent retreat. Yeah, it was pure agony for you. It oh. was a six day retreat because I left Which, early. <laughs> you, you bugged out. <laughs> I totally freaked out. When I was, <laughs> but you know, I was consoled by the fact that later on, I, I came to know a lot of Jesuits who do a 30 day Ignatian exercises. And they said, if you don't have a breakdown at some point, it doesn't work. <laughs> so St. Ignatius was a real sadist in some ways. <laughs> it's, is it there that you met one of the folks who uh, have been ordained, one of the woman priests? Was it? At... No, I met one of them. I can't remember. So I have a lot of connections. It's been a real blessing in the years since uh, that book came out. Really, that book really launched my career in a lot of ways as a religion writer. And I'm amazed that people still pick it up, which they do 12, 10, nine years. I don't know what year is it again. And in among the people that I've met were a lot of other women in the church who read it and men too. I just got an email from some guy who picked it up and said he was reading it. So, but the retreat, I don't do retreats anymore because I'm so bad at them. I go by myself instead, like go to a cabin or I go camping a lot on my own. And that's my retreat. So making contact with that first, the first Bible, right? Mother nature, mm -hmm. like, uh, as Richard that's Rohr right. would say, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just jump in to say, hi, Kaya. Mm -hmm. I, I won the lottery with the nuns are all right, mm -hmm. which I enjoy it a lot. It's very interesting. And I think it's a real service to the church, especially those of us who are involved in evangelization, the way you lay out all the various parameters and 
permutations of what what is cooking out there what what this the cookie cutter immigrant church is definitely gone and it's it's very interesting and the diversity and all that and maybe we'll have you on again and i'll get a chance to ask some questions about this because it's can't do it justice. Now, back to this conversation, though, let me ask you a question. In all these issues, what's your, you mentioned women's ordination and all kinds of things. I mean, go on and on with the institutional problems. What kind of hope do you have for this uh, synod process we're in? Do you have any hope for that? Or do you think it's just going to be sanitized and business as usual? Or do you think that the Vatican II, the spirit may surprise us I can't imagine, no matter what anybody says or how they do it, that these quote unquote hot button issues are not going to come up all over the planet. I mean, if nothing else, no one's going to say, well, that's a small group of malcontents. They're going to have to at least say it's a big group of malcontents. So anyways, I was just wondering what your thoughts are in the synod. Do you, if you have any hope for that or uh, skepticism or where are you on that? I think it's an interesting experiment and I'll be curious to see whether we get the whole story or just part of it. I have to admit, I haven't gone to a, a synod session at a church because I'm trying, I'm teaching, so I'm getting my COVID exposures in there. And so how's it going on your end of things when you, have you had one of these sessions, uh, Dennis, or been to one of them and what have you seen and heard? I'm wondering from your point of view, what's happening there? Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> I got well, nothing. I'm with you. Uh, I hear certain rumblings and I've seen a few things in the diocese come out that the, there's a meeting here or there, but again, with the COVID thing and, uh, and other issues. I haven't been able to make one of the sessions and I certainly haven't heard anything about it. So I don't know anybody, I don't know if Tom or Drew, have you heard? You know, any? I just received an email yesterday from the assistant office and it's asked for some response. And here's, here's the questions that they're asking for the synod process, right? How do I express God's love in my daily life outside the church? How do I help express God's love in my daily life within the ministry of the church? As we journey together as a church, what are the areas of ministry where we as a church are doing well? It blew my mind because I'm confused with the synod process about what are the problems of the church. They're not asking, what are people saying to you, deacon, about why they've left the church? So, so I, I, Did you get that email as a deacon or as a parishioner? As a deacon from the, from the uh, diaconate office. So I was a little miffed and I left it there, but I, I left it open because I had to come back to it and pinch myself because that's, I'm not hearing any of those questions from any of my parishioners. The, the gay issue, the, the divorced and remarried issue, or the political issue, who can receive communion, the worthiness of going on. So I don't know if this is the first of other types of uh, queries into the process, but yeah, I put that out there yeah. because I'm great. Yeah, it's, it was a little disconcerting to me. It sounds a deflection, like those questions sound, on the one hand, as a, I do spiritual direction and I, as a spiritual director, those are good reflective questions for spiritual direction and spiritual formation. On the other hand, they deflect from what you're talking about, which is why are people leaving the church and what can the church do to listen to people's sorrows and, and griefs and anger. It sounds like they're turning it and said, toward, um, let's talk about your spiritual life. That's important, but you have to have both. And it seems that there's not much room in those questions for the lat for people to be expressive. It's going to be all over the place because the questions you expressed, Kaya, are the questions that my pastor said that we're going to talk to our parishioners about. And he said that in November and then Omicron really ramped up and we have not had an opportunity to bring everybody together, which I assume is going to be all done in the next 30 days. The and timing is really terrible because they started this whole process in the fall. Is that right? And so you're right, because the variant sort of started to shut things down December, January, now we're in February, things are opening up again, people are going back to church, maybe, who weren't able to go. Are people going to want to go to a synod listening session and risk COVID exposure? <laughs> I don't know. So We're about to find out. Do it on Zoom like everything else. 
Well, I think that the synodal process is, whatever it's going to show, is going to show one thing for sure, how unsynodal we are as a group. I think that's going to be the lesson. We're all going to sit back and say, okay, we, we don't even have a handle on this. We really need to do some remediation before we even get into this. I'm pretty confident that that's going to be one of the takeaways just because of the conversations like this and the stuff we're seeing and what we're not seeing. And it's all been that. top down for 2,000 years. And now they that's want right. to try to come bottom up. That's right. That's how desperate we are. Now yeah. it's like the ship is sinking. <laughs> we need everybody to grab a pail. <laughs> So uh, speaking of grabbing pails, one last question, Kaya, in all your books, the whole question about why do you stay? Why do you put up with this? And I have a bunch of questions around this with the nun's book, because that is pretty much the book, the question that's being asked in various ways throughout that book. But I'm always struck by the people uh, like yourself that seem to, now, I, again, I consider this basic and it's not preached on enough. It's not brought to light enough. But it is there. I didn't make this up. And it's not new that in our baptism, we are baptized priest, prophet, and king. The traditional formulation of that. The prophetic vocation that we are all called to be prophets. And the one thing you know the prophets had in common was suffering. No one likes a prophet. It, it is not a popular position. It is a miracle of grace that our Jewish sisters and brothers have preserved an entire section in their scriptures of people saying, let me tell you what's wrong with you people, <laughs> pointing at themselves, which, you know, I mean, that's just amazing. And it's a great gift to the world. But the prophetic vocation, of course, is always suffering. And of course, Jesus talked about to take up your cross. And I mean, why that's not more alluded to and talked about and validated, I don't know. But anyways, I think that that is one of the answers to the why stay. This is what you signed up for. It's like marriage. For better, for worse is in there for a reason, in the vows. It's in the, it, because you're going to get both, guarantee that. I mean, that's not any kind of clairvoyance involved in that. Whoever you are, whatever happens from here on in, some of it's not going to be fun. Right. Is what, what you, you know, I think I see what you're doing very much as exercising that prophetic vocation. And I really am grateful to you for doing it instead of walking away. Thank you. I've heard that before, and I'm always a little worried <laughs> because I was like going to end up at the bottom of a well, like Jeremiah. Yeah, Just, you could. But that's okay. I've dealt with depression in, throughout my life, and that's the bottom of the well. And I've been there, and I feel for other people who have been there. But I also think that you're right, that we need to make it clearer to people there was a young man at this talk that my friend was giving last night and I was just interviewing a young gay Catholic said, what can I do in the church? And that's what I said. I said, be prophetic. And Thea Bowman, who's on the path to sainthood, who's a Franciscan sister of perpetual adoration, African-American nun, N-U-N, a very prophetic figure in American Catholicism. She said, for black Catholics that you need to bring your whole self to the church and not compartmentalize. And I think we need to encourage all of us to do that, to bring our whole selves. And that's something that we need to talk more about is how do we have a holistic faith, a faith that encompasses our whole selves. And so I, I felt the challenge sometimes is that I have to compartmentalize a lot. I teach at a secular school, but I'm a person with deep religious instincts and I write about religion, but I often put on a reporter hat, like in the nun's book and talk about other people. And then sometimes I'll bring myself into it a little bit more, but that siloing has hurt me sometimes psychologically. And I think to be prophetic, you have to be more, put yourself back together again. So I think that's important for people to think about. Recently, I was talking to somebody about the transfiguration. I don't remember. I talk to people about the weirdest things just sometimes, like out of nowhere. Oh, the transfiguration, right? But that's where Jesus shows his authentic self and he shows his real self. Why aren't we doing that more as a church? Why aren't we transfiguring and being witness to other people's transfigurations and showing our whole vulnerable selves? 
I've got a piece coming out. I'm starting a column in a magazine called The Revealer, which is put out by NYU. And I'm going to be writing about the issue of forgiveness. And one of the things I talk about in the piece is I'd love to hear celibate priests talk more about the sacrifice of not being in a relationship and not having children, because they sure love to talk about how other people <laughs> don't have children. And the Pope does this a lot. And so what would it mean to hear that? That's why deacons are important to the church too, because you all, some of you are fathers and some of you are married, so you have a very different narrative. Getting back to your point about prophecy, to accept a prophetic voice that we're given in our baptism means a more holistic approach to our faith and saying it's risky, it's hard, but it's worth it, just like marriage, just like friendship, just like any kind of commitment to a vocation and allowing lay people to say, I have a vocation in the church and giving us permission to have a vocation is something I see as my job is to help people find their permission to have a vocation as lay people. Yes, thank you. I agree. But I also think one of the things, just to, not to belabor this too much, that another piece that goes with that is even less talked about is that it is inherently prophetic witness is inherently suffering. You are signing up. I mean, it's, it's like saying I am joining the Marines, but I don't expect to be put out or exert myself or be anything but happy and comfortable all the time. People would say, well, you're in the wrong group. And again, this is throughout scripture, both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures that suffering is redemptive, we believe. I mean. A guy who's nailed to a cross, and we say, yep, that's where the thing turned around right there. But you don't get that sense of people, like in the nun book, N-O-N-E-S, your nun's book, the nuns are all right. There was a lot of people talking about, well, this doesn't fit me perfectly, or this doesn't, you know, interesting people searching for a perfect fit, which, of course, as someone who's been married a very long time, and happily so, I don't have a perfect fit with, with my wife. I don't know how you think you're going to find any organization where you're going to have a perfect fit. I don't care what organization it is. I found that kind of interesting. But I, I, just, I just wonder why we don't have more people who, who see the problems but are not willing to pay the price. Back to Dorothy Day, to pay, there's a price you're going to have to pay if you want to end racism, if you want to save this planet, if you want, I mean, it's like, why are we surprised and scared off or looking away and say, well, I'm not doing that. I mean, it's, well, there's no point in talking about if you're not worth doing that. This is the Marines. Don't you think it has to do with that whole secularization issue that um, we've got all kinds of pills to take away all the suffering and hurt? I mean, we're taking pills all day long. So you combine that with the catechesis where people have lost you know, the dimension of their faith, the understanding of the faith, the history of our church. And you're sitting now in, a, in the parishes that I've been in with older people who are acting out of rote. I've always done this. I got to get my ticket punched. There's, we can't get volunteers to work in the kitchen, let alone this whole idea of embracing sacrifice or going down to the soup kitchen or exposing themselves to the, the, the people on the margins. We, we live in a comfortable faith. And why would you leave that if, every, if, if these are the kind of questions we're getting for, uh, for the Synod, right? Life is good. Okay. Anybody got any problems? Who wants to rock this boat? And it's not happening. Yeah, I, it's tough because you can't, I'm not an evangelist and, and I'm not comfortable with that role, but I do think that you're not going to get people rushing to the doors if you tell them, come join the Catholic church where you'll suffer. <laughs> bad, bad marketing. Um, <laughs> but that being said, I think the pandemic is exposing a lot about our ideas, of our responsibility to one another. And one of the reasons that people put up with suffering who are Christian and not just Catholics, but anyone who's Christian is because they know that there's a redemption at the end of that. And the pandemic is showing us that we're not willing. And I say, we, I'm willing, I'll wear a mask to class. I will take care of my students, but there are, our mask mandate is ending tomorrow. And my students told me yesterday that they're afraid to come to class if no one's wearing a mask. So I said, 
the mask mandate will end for everybody except us. And so that's something where we're learning from the pandemic that part of it is that we're not willing to take on wearing a mask isn't suffering, but there are plenty of people who are telling us that for them it is. So culturally, we don't want to, to sacrifice for others. And I think that's American, not Christian, right? I think that's an American problem that our egos are leading the way, but we could go on and on about this. I'm sure. I just think that it's important to, to listen to why people aren't coming. You know what I mean? Not to just say, that's why I wrote the notes book. So say they're not coming and they're very, our church is comfortable. Our church is too easy, but I think people leave because they are, the church is causing them to suffer. And so it's not that the, it's not a good suffering. It's a bad suffering, right? And there, so we have to differentiate between suffering for redemption and suffering that is, is never going to end. It feels like it's never going to end. So I'll stop there. Excellent place to stop. Excellent point. There is a big difference between those two kinds of sufferings. Thank you very much, Kaya Oaks. I've enjoyed your book. I enjoy reading you when you show up in Commonweal and uh, America Magazine and the other places you do show up. And we hope that we can have you on again soon. Yeah, that'd be great. And thank you so much for having me as your first guest. I'm very honored. Well, so are we. Probably more than you <laughs> when you get right down to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Special thanks to El Jefe Paul Snatchko and our editor, David Dalt. The Deacon's Pod is powered by the Paulist Fathers. That's our offering. We thank you for being with us. On behalf of our colleagues at the Missionary Society of St. Paul the Apostle, we wish you a future brighter than any past. Till next time.